Good evening, everyone. I'm Komal Tyagi from Team Taxman, and I welcome you all in today's live session on General Anti Avoidance Rule (GAAR). But before we start, I shall take this opportunity to give a brief about Taxman. We are the leading publisher on tax and corporate laws in India, and with authenticity as one of our founding principles, we strive to offer the users an enriched experience of tax and corporate laws. Our goal is to make the research and compliance easier for the legal community. With our vision to achieve perfection, skill, and accuracy in everything that we do, we have worked strenuously over the years to offer the solutions that will continue to help you grow your practice. Our six decades of experience in the domain has helped us to constantly innovate and enhance our services and take the tax practice to a newer height. We have also developed the national website of the Income Tax Department, and we maintain it with the help of our technical team and the editorial. Now, I would like to introduce our speakers for the evening, Sri E. N. Dwarkanath and Sri Ram Shashadri. Mr. Dwarkanath has over 23 years of experience advising clients on international taxation and transfer pricing across several industries. He has successfully led cross-border and multi-dimensional teams in India and the US on large projects involving complex business restructuring, acquisition, and integration planning, value chain analysis, investment structuring, and exits. Mr. Sriram Sashadri has over 27 years of experience in advising clients on Indian tax laws and handling tax disputes. He extensively advises clients on international and domestic tax issues and helps structure transactions, PE deals, and transfer pricing matters. Mr. Sheshadri has successfully supported several government initiatives and appeared as a knowledgeable witness before the Parliamentary Standing Committee on the Direct Tax Code. He appeared before the Tax Administration Reforms Commission and he presented changes required towards uncertainty in tax laws before the Justice Issuer Committee set up by the Government of India. A warm welcome to both of you, sir. Now, before we proceed, I have a few tips for the audience. Your mic will be on mute. However, you may post your questions in the available chat box and your questions will be answered by the speakers during the session or after the session. And a copy of the presentation used in the webinar shall be sent to you in email for your future references. Now, without taking much time, I request Mr. Dwarkanath to address the audience. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Komal, and good evening to everybody. Thank you for joining us in today's session where we are going to spend about the next 50 minutes talking about the general anti-avoidance rules in India. The way we have laid out today's presentation is that we will start off with a little bit of an introduction to the GAR guidelines uh, how it came about, what was the government's thinking at the point in time when they introduced the provisions. We will talk about the framework of GAR as provided under the Income Tax Act. We will spend a significant amount of time talking about the clarifications issued by the CBDT in 2017, which to date remains um, the only area where the CBDT has come out and clarified in respect of GAR and therefore is important for us. We'll spend a minute talking about the interplay between the GAR and the multilateral instrument in terms of how it plays with tax treaties today. And finally, we will spend some time talking about jurisprudence, especially in the international context, knowing very well that some of those principles uh, can very well be applied in the Indian context as well. Um, as, as Komal said at the start of uh, the discussion, you could post your queries at any point in time in the chat box and we will try to address them towards the end of today's event. So if we if we start off with um, if we start off with a brief introduction to GAR itself, as we all know, the concept of tax planning or the context concept of GAR as such is not something new in India. Judicial GAR has always existed through the years in India, and historically, courts in India have always accepted the taxpayer's right or the taxpayer's ability to plan their affairs in a manner such, a, such that it yields them a particular benefit. However, at some point in time, 
there was a realization that a lot of taxpayers were resorting to extremely aggressive schemes which bordered on or in some cases tilted into tax avoidance. And therefore, in 2012, the then finance minister announced the introduction of the GAR provisions with the specific objective of countering aggressive tax avoidance schemes. Now, GAR, as we said, is basically an anti-avoidance law, and the objective is to curb evasion and to avoid tax leaks. All it does is that it codifies the principle that exists of substance over form, and as I said, which has been something that the government and the revenue has followed uh, through the years. As always, the OECD has done it, as well as in the Indian context, there is a distinction that is made between tax planning and tax avoidance. Generally speaking, the OECD considers tax avoidance as something which is an arrangement of a taxpayer's affairs where the intention of the taxpayer is to reduce his liability. And although the transaction or the arrangement is strictly legal, it is usually in contradiction with the intent of the law that it is supposed to follow. By contrast, tax planning refers to the arrangement of a person's business with the objective of minimizing the tax liability. So the gap that exists between tax planning and tax avoidance is what was sought to be addressed by the government through the introduction of the guard principles. If we move on to the next slide, we will, we will see how GAR prior to its introduction or leading up to its introduction has had a fairly long process uh, through the evolutionary scale. So as we said in 2012 at the budget was when the object of the, or the intent of the government to introduce the guard provisions was initially um, introduced. However, by the time the finance bill that year was enacted, the government had decided to defer it uh, for some time pending the release of guidelines and the constitution of an expert committee to look at those guidelines and rework on those guidelines. That committee was established in July of 2012 and they duly published the report in September of that year. Finally, in January of 2013, the government decided to postpone GAR for two years, and they decided that it should become applicable from the 1st of April 2016. In the Finance Act of 2015, however, based on representations received from many taxpayers, the government felt that it would, um, it would suit its interests and also the interests of taxpayers should it be deferred by another year, and therefore the implementation was deferred to 2017. In the interim, of course, the, the proposed GAR legislation led to a lot of questions, and the CBDT issued a circular, a circular number seven in January of 2017, um, coming up with some frequently asked questions in terms of situations where GAR could or could not be applied as per their interpretation. Um, and finally, as we know, the GAR came into effect from 2017. And then in February of 2022, which is earlier this year, the CBDT constituted the approving panel, which is one of the bodies which is prescribed in the mechanism in the law itself uh, for the implementation of the guard provisions. If we can move on now to the framework of the GAR, and, and I'll just lay out the broad framework and pass it on to Sriram to talk a little bit more in depth. The provisions of GAR are contained under Chapter 10A of the Income Tax Act. The provisions broadly are encompassed between sections 95 and 102. Some of the administration is laid out in section 144 BA. And of course, there are rules which deal with the administration of GAR as well as some of the exclusions that come up um, in the GAR context. Uh, the provisions of GAR basically empower the revenue authorities to declare a particular arrangement as an impermissible avoidance arrangement. And then the tax consequences in relation to such an arrangement would follow in terms of the law itself. As we said, GAR would apply from the 1st of April 2017. However, there are grandfathering provisions which apply in respect of investments made prior to the introduction of GAR, which is prior to April 1st, 2017. And we will talk about it a little further during this discussion. Interestingly, the provisions of this chapter will apply to situations where even a part of an arrangement is tainted by the provisions of GAR as if it would apply to the whole arrangement. 
So with that said, Sriram, I'll pass it on to you to take us through in a little more depth of card provisions itself. Thanks, Rudra. Am I audible? Okay. Like, uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. So like Dwarak said, uh, you know, this is a provision which is contained in Chapter 10A, which is an add-on provision to uh, a, a Chapter 10, which also dealt with avoidance of tax, starting from transfer pricing provisions of Section 92 and leading up to the limitation on interest being claimed under 94B, which we call as thin capitalization. So that's Chapter 10. And 10A, you know, comprises of all the GAR provisions entirely. Now, for applying GAR, and this is a provision that starts with a non obstante saying it, it overrides the provisions of the Act. Uh, and it has two limbs to it as it is diagrammatically represented here. That first limb is the primary condition where the main purpose of an arrangement is to obtain a tax benefit. And tax benefit is widely and inclusively defined as is appearing on the left box reduction or avoidance or deferral of tax, increase in refunds and so on and so forth. And more importantly, it is not enough only that the primary conditions are satisfied. Extremely crucial is the second condition, the additional condition. One of the four additional conditions are also satisfied, which are given on the right, right boxes here. And uh, you know the four things we will deal with a little bit, uh, you know, given our time constraints about each of this. For example, uh, on the right box, the first clause says that if the arrangement creates rights or obligations, which are not ordinarily created by persons dealing at arm's length. Now, it's important that the language used here is arm's length, but that doesn't mean that this is a transfer pricing arm's length. Here it talks about, it does, does not talk about pricing. It talks about rights and obligations which are created by the structure. And those rights and obligations are not naturally or normally created uh, between persons dealing at arm's length. Also, this provision does not necessarily apply only for a related party scenario. Even if two unrelated parties are entering into an arrangement, but those arrangements create the said rights and obligations that are not ordinarily created between persons dealing at arm's length, even then the provision of GAR could be applied. In other words, the primary condition must be satisfied that there is a tax benefit and the secondary condition, the first box must be checked to apply GAR. Similarly, the other boxes results in directly or indirectly in misuse or abuse of the provisions of the Act. It's a very interesting take that someone has that misuse or abuse is what is sought to be curbed here. For example, there are scenarios, situations where you may be just using the provisions. In fact, it is uh, you know, one of the famous rulings of the Supreme Court the Supreme Court made this distinction that misuse or abuse of provisions is different from just using a provision. In other words, if a taxpayer is naturally entitled to a certain incentive or a benefit, uh, and if the taxpayer was availing that benefit, it is not a misuse or an abuse, but the use of the provisions of the Act. Interesting variations will arise on this, that if a taxpayer is not naturally entitled to a an incentive, but takes steps to be qualifying for it. And those steps are bona fide. Can that revenue say that, look, you were not entitled to it and you are taking steps to be entitled to it? Uh, those kind of questions would arise. Broadly, the, the thinking in the, uh, in the legal fraternity is that if those steps are bona fide steps and within the framework of law, if you are uh, otherwise not entitled to it and you take steps to be entitled to it, it is still a reasonable position to take that, you know, maybe the second condition is not satisfied. These kind of interesting issues will arise. Lacks commercial substance, there is a separate slide on it, we'll come back to it in a minute, and enters into or carries, carried out by means or manner, not ordinarily employed for bona fide purposes. These are very interesting usage of language highly subjective in, in certain aspects, what is not ordinarily employed, the means uh, or the manner that should not be ordinarily employed and for bona fide purposes. So questions do arise that when a transaction is consummated and all the legal steps for the consummation of transaction are appropriately carried out, can it be said that the means and the manner are ordinarily carried out you know, in a bona fide manner because it is in within the framework of law. Are we then looking at legal documentation alone or is it too, too narrow a view 
to be taken for an anti avoidance provision or is it you know you need to look at the steps which are taken not the manner of documentation but the steps which are taken by the parties which are not ordinarily employed for bona fide purposes that leads to the question of what is bona fide as a purpose should it be just opposite of malafide in other words if there is a genuine business transaction can it be then said it is employed for bona fide purposes these kind of very interesting issues uh, you know are coming up as we speak uh, you know gar notices have started coming across uh, for uh, you know taxpayers and therefore it is important that we deal with it and uh, dwarak also alluded to the fact that the panel has already been set up and therefore it, it is very timely that we look at some of these things and mull over as to what the law means in all this the legend under the, under these boxes is extremely important and please do reflect on it for a second there is a rebuttable presumption in law here 962 presumes that unless otherwise proven by the ssc the onus is on the taxpayer and the taxpayer has to prove and the government can assume that uh, the transactions entered into the main purpose is for obtaining the tax benefit if the main purpose in a step or part of the arrangement is for tax benefit notwithstanding that the main purpose for the whole arrangement is not tax benefit in other words what it's saying is that if there are several steps in a transaction and if one of the steps is for a tax benefit then it colors the entire transaction and the government can presume that the entirely it is only for tax benefit and the onus is on the taxpayer now one of the important elements here is that it poses an enormous burden on the taxpayer the reason being that it is a presumption made by the government which has to be rebutted and generally if there are two choices two options available for a taxpayer one of which is tax efficient and the other is not it is quite natural for the person to choose the one which is tax efficient then therefore one of the steps there may be for you know a tax benefit and if that taints the entire structure and then it ends with saying that notwithstanding the fact that the main purpose of the whole arrangement is not for tax benefit but that one step is it will taint the entire uh, structure and the onus is on the taxpayer is a fairly enormous burden two things and please note that this satisfies only the first box that is main tax benefit even in that presumption it, it is arguable that the additional conditions have to be shown by the by the government and that onus will still be on the revenue only to show that's one aspect i wouldn't be surprised that in the foreseeable future if there are writ petitions filed in appropriate cases where it may be argued that this is too onerous a burden and should be read down that's a possibility as well can moving on to the next slide what is lacking commercial substance we can quickly look at is that few instances are looked at as lacking commercial substance and deeming to lack commercial substance like the uh, substance or effect of the arrangement as a whole is different from the individual steps so there are individual steps being taken there is a larger purpose for the transaction and there is a discordant note between the two then uh, this is la lacking commercial substance round tripping location of uh, assets or transactions or residence this is very important because a lot of times in international structures we see that certain assets are located in a particular jurisdiction that jurisdiction may not necessarily only give tax advantage but it could be ip protection it could be the whole ecosystem in a particular transaction is so well developed that you may need a certain registration certain contracts to be entered from that particular jurisdiction those kind of cases are fairly routine in international uh, transactions so if something like that is involved it can this can be deemed as lacking commercial substance if it is without any substantial commercial purpose please note the language used is substantial commercial purpose so it must be it cannot be a peripheral very minimalistic benefit but it has to be demonstrated as a substantial commercial benefit only then you will get over it and there are other conditions like does not have significant effect on business etc and on the right side is also very important lot of times typically the argument of any taxpayer would be look i this is not put in for any tax purposes tax benefit this has existed for several years perhaps decades and there could be even cases where a global corporation acquires the other company 
and the, the acquirer will say that, look, this preceded our acquisition and we have inherited the structure. So what, and this is all, all the three points put in here, you would see, uh, you know, going back to the famous ruling of the Supreme Court in Vodafone 341 ITR page one, where they de dealt with uh, indirect transfer of uh, shares. In that, the Supreme Court had recognized the longevity of the arrangement, the taxes which were paid under the arrangement, the exit route, etc., while determining whether uh, you know it was taxable or not. That these are aspects which the Supreme Court looked at. Therefore, when this law is being framed, the law is framed in a manner that they have accepted that they are relevant because Supreme Court has said so, but they have held it as not sufficient test. Something merely this alone is not enough. Something more needs to be demonstrated, perhaps the commercial substance that needs to be demonstrated. Next slide, please. So if a, if a structure becomes an avoidance structure, what happens then? The consequences are dealt with in section 98. It inures wide power to the tax officer to deal with a lot of things. We'll quickly look at a few of them. For example, combine uh, steps or recharacterize. Combine a step. For example, there are cases reported cases in the past uh, where a transaction happens, a step happens, and then the second step, which, which is happens in the first step, inures a certain tax benefit. And the second step is actually the final transaction with the third party. So in other words, there is a related party step and then a third party step. Or it could be a third party step also, which is not having any commercial benefit. So the government can say that, look, this first step that you took has given a tax benefit to you. It could be a cost upside. So they could disregard that step itself. Or they could treat that party to be an accommodating party. For example, that party, I sell an asset to that party and that party in turn sells it immediately to for a larger value to a third party. And uh, the, the intermediate buyer had losses to set off, for example. So they could say that uh, the intermediate party uh, is a party to the whole arrangement. He's an accommodating party. I will I will combine the two and treat the two of you as one. That could be done. Reassign places. For example, we just discussed about situs of assets. They could say that, look, this asset cannot be located here. The, the commercial purpose that you are alluding to is minimal, not substantial. Therefore, we will disregard the location. Likewise, the last box, equity to debt and vice versa is very interesting. It will throw up a lot of dispute. For example, many of you may have seen that uh, in the transfer pricing scheme of things, when we are faced with uh, com con convertible debentures, a lot of cases arose where CCDs were treated as equity by the transfer pricing officer. Cases went to the tribunal. Tribunal held that such recharacterization is impermissible. And uh, those were cases pre-GAR. Now, the question arises as to post-GAR, what happens to those kind of cases? Will it be a carte blanche for the revenue to be able to use the GAR provisions to recharacterize? Or is it that I talked about Chapter 10, it starts with transfer pricing, ends with uh, 94B, which is a limitation on interest, thin capitalization. When that limitation on interest came, it was articulated in the memorandum introducing these changes, that these changes are introduced as some sort of an anti-avoidance provision. It is a, you know, based on the BEPS action plan. And uh, question that arises is, therefore, is that a SAR, specific anti-avoidance? Is that enough to address? And therefore, you don't need the GAR applicability. The counter argument could be that 94B applies only for related party transactions. What if there is an unrelated party transaction? Can it be, can GAR be applied? Again, a very interesting situation that arises. So these are the various consequences which the tax officer uh, you know, has power to bring upon us on the taxpayer. Next slide, please. When will it not apply? Three crores uh, minimal limit is given. It's not a large number. Only thing is, it is for the relevant assessment year. So three crores is for each year. It's not for across the transaction, across the years. It's for each year. Uh, this is contained in Rule 10U as exclusion. Uh, foreign finance, you know, in uh, FIIs who have not taken the DTAA benefits and list, investing in listed security or unlisted securities, they, they are carved out. And the important one is the last one, income arising from the transfer of investments made before April 1, 2017. This was again being clarified even in the CBDT circular that we will deal with later. Issues do arise there that I made an investment originally before April 2, 2017. 
it is a convertible instrument. I converted the instrument later on. Will the same benefit be applicable? They have clarified that to be grandfathered. Uh, many such issues will arise, uh, you know, in uh, so prior to 2017, any investments made would be grandfathered and there is an income that from a transfer of those assets will not be subject to GAR provisions. Next slide. Now, having seen this, let's quickly look at the framework of what the law uh, puts out on the proceeding itself. It starts only with the assessing office. It cannot be by the TPO. It cannot be by a CIT appeals. It cannot be by a commissioner in a 263 proceeding. It has to be by an assessing officer. It could be an assessment or a reassessment proceeding. That's the starting point. If the officer feels that uh, or believes that this is an avoidance transaction, the first thing that he or she does is to issue the notice to the assessing uh, SSE concerned, giving an opportunity to make out a case as to why this is not an avoidance transaction. Now, this is coming out of the rules. You will not see this in the main enactment. It's in the rule. And once that happens, that's the taxpayer is to respond. And the taxpayer, once he responds, the officer may or may not be satisfied. If, if they are not satisfied, that then the ball is thrown into the uh, arena of the commissioner or the principal commissioner. It's a reference made by the AO to the CIT. Then the CIT repeats by sending a notice, asking, giving us opportunity of being heard. Again, on the same point, the a taxpayer will be making the points on why it is not an avoidance transaction. Thereafter, if the commissioner is satisfied, it may end there. The whole proceedings may end up being dropped. But if not, then it may is another reference is made. This is the approving panel. And the reason why the government has built in, you know, these two la two layered structure is that there were apprehensions about the, you know, the how appropriately the R provisions will be used in order to give a certain gravitas to the whole proceeding. They have chosen to have uh, an approving panel comprising of a serving commissioner, an expert from uh, outside and a retired judge to bring the certain uh, independence and uh, objectivity to the trans to the whole proceeding. This is what is uh, done. And then the GAR panel uh, hears the taxpayer and then decides whatever is to be done. And an order is passed and that order becomes binding on the taxpayer, uh, sorry, on the tax uh, officer. And like much like the DRP proceedings, which all of us are familiar with, the order gets served and the assessing officer should pass an order and an appeal goes directly to the tribunal. Now, the only glitch there is that uh, it is not an appeal against the approving panel's order, uh, which would have been a great situation to be in because there would be no tax demand. Nevertheless, now the way it is said, the, of the officer has to pass the order, which means the demand will crystallize. And against the assessment order, the appeal lies to the uh, tribunal. And to that extent, we may have to deal with you know, tax payments and stay petitions and so on and so forth. A uh, couple of things do arise for consideration. Is there a mechanism or ways to challenge this in a writ proceedings, etc.? Perhaps, yes. But the first instance when the AO issues a notice is just a show cost notice. And the second instance the commissioner does is also, again, a show cost notice. And... The third instance, when the approving panel passes an order, perhaps uh, that's it, because many times the courts don't interfere at a, uh, at a stage of show cause. Maybe that, we don't know that yet. We have to test it out. Approving panel stage is a stage where perhaps there is a merit for challenging it. That said, there are several cases where against the DRP's order where challenges were made. Some courts accepted those challenges. Some courts directed it back saying that you have a tribunal option. There is an alternative remedy. You should avail it. So much needs to be seen. That said, there is one already reported case where against the approving panel's order, a, a writ petition has already been filed and admitted in a court. So that there is a precedence to that effect. So these are the framework of guard provisions. Now we will move to what the CBDT's take is on all this. Uh, over to Dwarak. Thanks, Sriram. So as I, had, as I had said earlier, the only real guidance which has emanated from the government so far, and obviously because this is still a relatively new legislation, is by way of the FAQs which were published in January of 2017. So the government came out with a series of about 16 questions, 
laying out different circumstances that they estimated that assessees would be subject to, and then provided their views of whether or not GAR should be triggered in such situations. So what we have done is we have picked up a majority of those 16 questions, and we'll just talk through some of these uh, because they're important in, the, in, in this context. The first point that comes up often is the interplay between the GAR, which is the general anti-abuse provisions, and the SAR, which as we know is the specific anti-abuse provisions. And the question is, the question was whether the two of them could coexist. And in those FAQs, the government did clarify that SAR is meant to target specific situations, and it, they can never be a situation where SAR provisions can adequately cover all sorts of tax situations. And therefore, they did clarify that both GAR and SAR provisions can very much coexist. Now, that then led to a situation saying, what happens in the case of tax treaties? Now, as we know, there are many tax treaties where there are specific LOB provisions or limitation of benefit provisions. And the question raised was, what happens in those situations? Does the government have the power to apply GAR in such situations? Now there, what the circular has said is that in situations where the LOB clause adequately addresses the issue of tax avoidance, GAR should not be invoked. Now the question obviously is, in what situations can it be said that the LOB provision sufficiently or adequately addresses GAR? Uh, one example that comes readily to mind is the context of the India-Singapore tax treaty where in the context of capital gains, the treaty itself lays down a specific limitation of benefits clause. It lays down an expense test, it lays down an activity test, and then it says that as long as these are satisfied, then the capital gains benefit should be reasonably available to the taxpayer. Now, that is a situation where quite clearly, there is an adequate clarity and a specific LOB which addresses a particular situation where ideally a GAR should not be, uh, should not be invoked. However, there are several other treaties which are, which are not as specific. They may just provide a blanket exemption or a blanket situation where a treaty benefit may be available. And in those situations, it is very much possible for the, for the revenue to contend that the LOB provisions do not adequately address GAR and therefore they have the ability to invoke GAR. Now, this does have an interplay also with the principal purpose test that we will talk about a little bit later, which is a lot more stringent in terms of its application. Uh, the circular went ahead and it clarified that uh, GAR will not interplay with the right of the taxpayer to select um, a method of implementing a transaction. Again, that's just uh, the commercial decision of a taxpayer to go ahead and apply a particular uh, method that it wants to a transaction. Uh, the question also that they addressed was what happens to investments through tax efficient jurisdictions, uh, which we have seen. Um, again, here the circular clarified where, where there are sufficient non-tax commercial consideration and the main purpose as we spoke about is not to obtain a tax benefit, then GAR should not apply. Now here, the challenge very often is for companies to establish what the non-commercial considerations for certain investment jurisdictions are. For example, could it be a strong IP protection law? Could it be the fact that there are certain headquarter benefits available in a jurisdiction? Could it be the fact that there is significant economic activity or employment generation by that group in a particular jurisdiction, which is why they wanted to use it? Could it be the fact that the reporting structure is simplified through that particular uh, jurisdiction or through investing through those jurisdictions? Some of these are examples of non-tax commercial considerations that could, um, that could be taken by assessees to establish that a structure is not intended to avoid tax. Grandfathering, Sriram spoke about this. Grandfathering was a big one of investments which are made prior to April 1st, 2017, which is prior to GAR coming into effect. They also went ahead and they clarified situations where taxpayers had convertible instruments or they had bonus shares which were issued or share splits had taken place, etc. And all these would go back to the original issue. And as long as the original issue was made prior to April 1, 2017, then the circular allowed for a grandfathering of, of those investments or the income arising from those investments. GAR would not apply to a ruling by the AAR. And that made perfect sense because generally the AAR would not be able to admit an application which was intended to avoid tax. Uh, so automatically that would be ruled out. The question now arises, 
uh, with the move to the to the board for advanced rulings coming in, uh, would GAR also not be invoked in situations where a ruling is given by the board of advanced rulings? Um, the next one is a very interesting one. Now we've all seen a lot of transactions such as mergers or demergers, which are carried out with the blessings of courts, such as the National Company Law Tribunal. The question in the FAQ was whether in such situations GAR could be invoked because these, these transactions are generally carried out with the blessing of the tribunals or the courts. The CBDT clarified that where the court had explicitly and adequately considered the tax implications while sanctioning the approval, GAR will not apply. Now, again, this is very interesting because we have seen a lot of cases practically when you go to the NCLT for merger, the NCLT or a demerger, the NCLT kicks the ball back to the jurisdictional tax officers and asks them for a clearance as to whether or not they should be approved from a tax standpoint. Um, where, of course, there are objections, the tax authority goes ahead and offers those objections. But more often than not, as a matter of routine, we are seeing that the tax authorities generally say that, look, we, while we don't have an objection to the scheme of arrangement itself, we do reserve our right to carry out an assessment, including in respect of GAR at a later point in time when the matter comes up in due course. Courts, by and large, have been honoring that and in passing their merger or demerger orders, they have been allowing the tax authorities to apply the lens of GAR at a later point in time when the matter comes up for assessment in the normal course. Um, I just wanted to point out two cases out here, one from the Mumbai NCLT and one from the Chandigarh NCLT, where courts, where the NCLTs took slightly contrary views. Uh, the Mumbai NCLT is a very interesting one. It had to do with a merger transaction of related parties, ultimately owned by the same promoter group. And when it went back to the tax department for comments, the tax department raised an objection where they believed that the main objective of this merger was to obtain a tax benefit. The court in that case, the NCLT, respected the view of the tax authorities. And they said that in their view, the merger was being done with the intent of avoiding tax and therefore car is something that would have applied in that case. In the case of the Chandigarh NCLT, um, similarly, it went back uh, to the tax authorities. The tax authorities said, look, we have no objection. However, we do reserve the right to examine this under GAR later. The court said, look, prima facie, it does not appear to us that this is a transaction to avoid tax. Um, where there are losses, et cetera, those are taken care of by merger provisions and loss carry forward provisions under the statute itself. However, that said, this does not take away the right of the department to examine the case under the guard provisions at a later point in time in the course of the normal assessment. So this is something where we are seeing the practical application of this FEQ come in. Um, in terms of the application of domestic law or treaty by taxpayers in different assessment years, I think the FAQ has just went ahead and clarified saying that's not something um, that GAR is meant to come in and, and inter, intercede on. It's up to the taxpayer to decide whether they take treaty benefits in one year or whether they want to take domestic law benefits in one year. If you move to the next slide, just have a few more FAQs. Um, again, the, the circular, this was more clarificatory in nature. Uh, where a particular consequence is being applied to one of the recipients, then a corresponding adjustment in the hands of the other recipient would not be made. Again, the objective here was just to ensure that GAR would be applied holistically and they should not, it should not be applied with a view to inconvenience a taxpayer or to result in a double whammy. Uh, they did clarify that the tax benefit would be in the context of Indian jurisdictions because they were question raised saying what happens if the, you know, should you assess the benefit in different jurisdictions which are obtained by the taxpayer? So they've clarified it would be in the context of Indian jurisdiction, and they also clarified that it would be assessment specific. Um, they clarified that if the arrangement is held as permissible in a particular year, and if the facts and circumstances remain the same, which is obviously important, then GAR should ideally not be invoked in subsequent years, which makes absolute sense. And finally, there was, of course, the ask for an exemption from penalty and and naturally enough, the CBDT said, look, the levy of penalty depends on facts and circumstances, and we cannot grant a blanket exemption in respect of penalties. So these were some of the key clarifications that the government came up with. Um, and I just want to spend a minute, um, if you just move ahead to the next slide, 
on the interplay between the multilateral instrument uh, under the BEPS, BEPS program and GAR. Now, as we know, the MLI has come into effect in a number of countries. The MLI in respect of a lot of treaties that India has has already come into effect. Um, and there are covered tax agreements which have come into effect in the Indian context as well. Many of these MLIs have what is called a principal purpose test. And what that posits is that having regard to all the relevant facts and circumstances, if obtaining a tax benefit was one of the principal purposes of a particular arrangement, and that resulted directly or indirectly in a benefit, then the provisions of the tax treaty should not apply. Now, interestingly here, as I said, when, when Sriram spoke about GAR, GAR talks about the main purpose of the particular transaction or arrangement being the obtaining of a tax benefit. And then, of course, uh, there are additional conditions to be satisfied. The principal purpose test is far more stringent. If even one of the principal purposes of an arrangement is to obtain a tax benefit, which is not in accordance with what the treaty is intended for, then the principal purpose test is triggered and it can result in the denial of a treaty benefit. So from a consequence standpoint, of course, because the PPT deals specifically with tax treaties, it deals with transactions which are covered by tax treaties and therefore the denial of the treaty benefit is a consequence. GAR, of course, has a number of different transactions which Sri Ram spoke about, including the recharacterization of income, denial of treaty benefits, et cetera, is just one of them. There are certain safeguards, as we saw in the case of GAR. In fact, there are multiple safeguards, right? It is There are multiple show cause notices. It finally goes to an approving panel. Uh, before GAR can be invoked, there are sufficient and more opportunities given to taxpayers. And there is a high degree of safeguard which is established in the legislation itself. By contrast, the principal purpose test is something that has to be determined by the countries because it is signed off in the tax treaty itself. So as long as the government can establish that one of the objectives was the avoidance of tax, and that was in, in contradiction with the objectives of the treaty, then the PPT is triggered and the tax treaty is denied. Uh, there are grandfathering provisions under GAR, as we saw. There are no grandfathering provisions in, in PPT, which means the minute the PPT comes into effect, which is generally the first day of the year following the year when uh, it is lodged, et cetera, by the government, um, the PPT comes into effect and there is no grandfathering. There is a there is a three crore tax benefit under GAR, which has been prescribed, but there is no similar uh, threshold which is described under the principal purpose test. So having looked at some of these uh, key provisions under the FAQ and also the interplay between the GAR and the, and the treaties and the principal purpose test, um, I think, Sriram, it will be interesting if we run through some of the jurisprudence, especially in the international context, because yeah. I'm sure that will have application going forward as well for us. That's right. Uh, so uh, GAR provisions being new to India, I, I think the taxpayers, the tax authorities, as well as courts may look for international guidance. Uh, while it may not be binding, but it will be good for them to refer back to those principles. So with that in mind, we have put, to, put a few things together. Uh, one thing is internationally, there have been, uh, you know, uh, extremely complex structures which have been put in, in the past, whereas in Indian context, uh, generally there is a restriction from a FEMA angle or a corporate law angle to achieve that. So therefore, we have picked a few cases which we will run through, which is more uh, contextualized from an India standpoint. We can move to that now. So if you see the few boxes, interest paid to group companies. You, the idea is here not to run through each fact pattern and say what, what had happened and how the countries have approached it, but broadly on what kind of areas we have seen GAR application in the past. Interest paid for acquisition of shares. There is a, you know, foreign, the parent pumps in money into the subsidiary who acquires the shares of another company. And those kind of cases where GAR had been invoked favorably, unfavorably, the results have turned out depending on how the courts have approached it and the fact pattern. But that's been uh, you know, one area. Royalty uh, payments also where a transfer had happened from one uh, AE to another AE. Uh, and the, there has been adequate consideration passed on that uh, acquisition. And uh, the buyer steps up the royalty payment. And on that basis also, royalty has, uh, sorry, GAR has been applied to say that there are no justification to pay a higher royalty for the same IP rights. 
Now, interestingly, in Indian context, normally because these are transfer price, TP provisions will apply. And in the past, we have had similar cases where I do recall even personally arguing that what I have done in the past is already a colored transaction. It's not, it can't be a comparable transaction. It's my transaction with one AE. It can't be taken as a comparable. And what I have to be compared with is only a third party benchmarking. So you cannot look at what I have done in the past to justify what I have done in the future. And those kind of arguments will probably come up. It will be interesting to see. Uh, you know, capital gain exemptions being denied uh, on the basis that the the whole the structure itself is created only for uh, tax avoidance. This is something which we have seen uh, for many years now, uh, especially in the context of Mauritius. Uh, you know, treaty benefits being denied. This is something that we have seen. Next slide. Sale and lease back. I, I have a trademark. I have an IP right. I sell those IP rights for, for a certain consideration, but get it back for pay, paying royalties. Those cases also GAR has been applied. But the big one is the beneficial ownership on both royalty and interest payments, where the uh, tax authorities have alleged that the entity which receives the dividend or interest is only a flow through entity and it does no dominion over the income. It is designed only to receive the money and pass it on to someone else. And the intention of this intermediate company is purely from a low tax jurisdiction or a tax treaty benefit. And on those cases, uh, you know, guard provisions have been applied. Again, the answers to whether this is right or wrong, what should be the final outcome, etc are extremely fact specific, but this is to give a flavor of the nature of cases on which GAR has been applied uh, internationally. And we should be expecting those happening in India. And there are some cases already on beneficial ownership, of course, uh, which have already emerged in Indian context, but the rest of it is something that we'll have to see. Um, next, I'll pass it back to you, Dwarak. Thanks. So I'll, I'll just spend a minute talking through some of the key key takeaways and something that all taxpayers should be aware of. Um, and then we have a few minutes for questions so we can just pick up some of the questions that have come up. We may not be able to answer all the questions, uh, but we will try to address some of them. Um, as, we, as we started this discussion, CAR applies the test of commercial expediency. And therefore the mere satisfaction of the provisions of the act of the treaty may no longer be sufficient. That means each and every transaction that companies or taxpayers are carrying out from this point on has to be viewed from the lens of whether or not this is something that has commercial expediency or this has uh, this is something that has a business reason. Uh, one of the ways to do this is to test the transaction to see whether alternate structures are possible. And if that does not lead to tax avoidance, then clearly GAR should not be invoked in such circumstances. We spoke about the onus being on the taxpayer initially, and then the subsequent conditions, the onus being in respect of um, the revenue. Uh, we spoke about the GAR provisions being invoked, even though they might be SAR provisions or LOB condition, uh, conditions which are prescribed, and therefore it has to be tested on a standalone basis. And importantly, documentary evidence must be maintained in respect of transactions. Now, what does this mean in respect of all taxpayers? Now, we are now five years into the car regime. It is important, you know, many times when we go back and we look at some of the transactions that we might have consummated, they have been carried out for absolutely commercial reasons, for business reasons. However, when we look at it in hindsight, we find that perhaps we have not documented those reasons adequately. So it would be important for taxpayers to just take a look at those transactions again through the lens of GAR now with the benefit of hindsight and make sure that whatever were the commercial reasons due to which they had carried out a particular transaction are coming out as well through their transaction documentation. That is something that's, that's something that they should do. Um, as we also said, Test your transactions through alternative structures. If those alternative structures also show that there is really no tax benefit or there is no tax avoidance, then chances are that car should not be involved. But in summary, this is really the new way of life. 
This is how transactions are being tested across the world. And this is how rightly transactions are being tested in India. Look at your documentation, consider your transactions from a commercial standpoint, and then make sure that you are satisfying these provisions before you go ahead and trigger it. So with that, um, Sriram, we should probably move on to some questions. We have about five minutes left, five or six minutes yeah. left. We can pick up some questions. Yes. Ashik, do you have qu any questions there? Yes, sir. Dwarak Sriram, thank you for that. Uh, I'll, the first question, Dwarak, will you want to take it up? Uh, does GAR override treaty provisions? Thanks, Ashik. Yeah. So I think we, we we spoke about this at length, both in the context of the LOB provisions, as well as in the context of the principal purpose test. So I, I think the CBDT has also been fairly clear that in circumstances where the LOB provisions do not adequately address avoidance, they have the ability to look at the transaction through the lens of car. Yeah. So Ashik, yeah, we can move to the next one. Sure. Uh, Sriram, there has been a question repeatedly asked that, GAR applies to both domestic transactions or only to foreign transactions? Of course, it applies to uh, all kinds of transactions. Wherever there is a tax benefit, the government has the right to look at it uh, and also look at the additional conditions if they are satisfied to be invoking GAR provisions. Uh, it has no, uh, it is non-discriminatory in nature when it comes to application of GAR. It applies to corporate and non-corporate, could apply to HEO fund trust, on a, any transaction on the uh, which which will have impact on the income side. Thank you, Shiram. You also addressed another question, which was uh, whether the additional conditions also need to be satisfied, or is it only the primary conditions? Are they to be read together, or is it only the primary condition? No, they are to be read together. The secondary condition should also be satisfied, but one of the secondary conditions have to be satisfied. So, and and what I have seen uh, personally in uh, some cases is that the tax authorities are uh, throwing more than one additional condition uh, being uh, satisfied, as at least alleging that more than one condition is being satisfied. Probably it's an attempt to see what sticks, but uh, that's something that we should anticipate. Thank you, Sriram. Uh, Twarak, one of the interesting questions is that I think this is with reference to the three crore limit also, whether GAR is objectively to be applied or subjectively to be applied? That's, that's a very interesting question, Ashika. <laughs> so I, I think the way I would address this is by saying that GAR by nature is a subjective determination. Um, as we started off this discussion, there is a very fine line between tax planning and tax avoidance. What matters in many cases is what is the intent of the taxpayer in carrying out a particular transaction in a particular fashion, and how is that intent being demonstrated, right? Which means, is there adequate commercial rationale for carrying out a transaction in a particular manner? I think the objectivity in the law is laid out in some of the safeguards that the main purpose has to be tax avoidance, that one of the additional conditions need to be satisfied, that there is a three crore threshold which has to be looked at per assessment year um, and in respect of the transaction as a whole. So those are some of the more objective areas which the law has, state, um, has stated. But whether or not a transaction can be considered as avoidance is by definition going to involve a high degree of subjectivity. Thank you, Dwarak. Shiram, back to you for another interesting question. Wherein if I've done restructuring, reshuffling of entities, and by virtue of the restructuring, I have obtained a side benefit, that is the term used by the queryist, of tax. Uh, how do you see GAR being applied by the tax authorities? Sometimes the side benefit may end up being also substantial also. So that's a... It's a of course, see, the point is that uh, you know all the time in the corporate world, some sort of a restructuring happens. Uh, many times it is necessitated by a third-party transaction. It could be necessitated because of entity rationalization and so on and so forth. So when you're doing that and if there is a tax benefit that arises, obviously the, 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 the formula is the same. Uh, in every case, 
we are going to put the same formula to test. Is there a tax benefit? And is there those additional conditions being satisfied? Just take a case of an entity rationalization. So is in, in entity rationalization, there may be a tax advantage you would have ended up obtaining. But the question is, uh, are the additional conditions satisfied? Is it not bona fide? Does it lack commercial substance? Uh, is it abuse or misuse or just use of the provisions? Or is it uh, creating rights and obligations which do not accrue or arise between two, uh, you know, two parties dealing at arm's length? These are the conditions, right? So you'll have to ask ourselves that, for example, if I'm merging an entity, uh, if there is a sale of a under business that I had, and after that, that entity had no reason to exist if I were to merge that entity. So the same questions we have to ask ourselves, whether these tests would be satisfied in our view. And that is where the documentation part, which uh, Dwarak talked about will also be relevant. And also asking ourselves the question as to, is there any other way that I could have done this whole transaction? If the other way that I would have done the transaction either results in similar tax positions, or it would not achieve my commercial uh, you know, uh, reason as to why I started off in the first place. In both cases, you could, you could articulate and document saying that this is the possible other alternative to do this. But in this alternative, this is what it results in. But my commercial objective of doing this is X, but it is not achieving, allowing me to achieve X for this reason. And therefore, you would, you would articulate that I, what I have done is not uh, you know, a tax avoidance. Now, mind you, in all this 96.2 that we talked about where there is a rebuttable presumption, where there is one step, it may color the whole, is a, is a very uh, you know, uh, onerous step, really. And that is something which we will have to sort of uh, surmount. And I, I also pointed out that colors only the tax benefit part of it. It still leaves you with the additional conditions. And all that I'm talking about, what you ask yourself is on the additional condition side. I'll pause. Ashik, back to you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Shriram. Uh, Taxman team, do we have time for a few more questions? We have. Ashik, maybe we can take one, one last question and then close it with that. Yeah, yes, sure. sir. Yes, sir. Please proceed. Uh, Shriram, I'll come back to you for this one. Uh, there is a question which says, can I resort to MAP once GAR is invoked or to extend the question, any other alternate remedies once GAR is invoked? It's a, it's a big one to close out a, <laughs> a session. Uh, let me try to uh, think through this. MAP is, a, you know, when, when there is a taxation which is not in accordance with the tax treaty. That's the first and foremost thing. Uh, and then the MAP gets uh, invoked uh, and then it proceeds. So th that's the first fundamental question. In your case, is the taxation not in accordance with the tax treaty? For example, if the tax treaty itself is uh, you know, disregarded and, uh, and the guy, Indian government's position is that you are not even, this whole structure is abusive. So the question is, is MAP going to be fruitful for us? End of the day, MAP is only an agreement. And for an agreement, there is a consensus which needs to be finalized, right? And if the Indian government's view is that the treaty itself is, uh, you know, not applicable, how likely is the government to even come on to the table for negotiating on MAP? That's a big question, right? Many times, th this, this clearly map is normally an option. But for binary issues, like, for example, royalty being taxable or not, whether there is PE or not, Versus whether there is an attribution, an X amount or a Y amount, the success is, what we have seen, the traction is better in the latter. Now, if you have to see whether GAR would be applicable, whether the treaty will apply or not, is a fairly binary position. Uh, so you will have to keep, I'm, I'm giving a 30,000 feet answer really without facts on the table, but these are the things that you will have to ask yourself. Uh, is there a certainty that both parties will negotiate on the table and walk, walk with an acceptable solution? If the answer is no, MAP may be possible but not practical. That's uh, that's how we will have to look at this whole thing. Thank you. Uh, 
Dwarak, just back to you for closing remarks and an overriding question, an overarching question, which is be there. Uh, what do you think have to be safeguards to protect against a GAR assessment? Right. So thanks, Ashik. So so look, safeguards. I think we spoke about right. I think the the key aspect would be to ensure that companies and taxpayers sufficiently document the commercial rationale for carrying out a transaction in a particular fashion. I think that is going to be absolutely critical as a safeguard. If you do have adequate reasons, which most cases there are, then make sure that those reasons come out well through your documentation trail. Uh, to my mind, that is the best safeguard that exists from a taxpayer standpoint, factually. Yes, from a legal standpoint, there are a variety of arguments that can always be taken based on how the law is written out and whether or not conditions would be satisfied or whether or not car can be invoked, etc. But there is really no substitute for ensuring that commercial expediency test is adequately satisfied. Uh, so with that, Ashik, I think we will close for this evening. Uh, thank you very much for joining this evening session. Uh, we hope that it has been fruitful. And uh, I'm sure the taxman team uh, will pass it back to you. Uh, for anything to close from your end. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. We really appreciate the subject matter and the way you explain it to the audience. I also wish to thank the participants for being so cooperative. Thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedule and joining us in this session to make it a success. Though the speakers have tried to reply most of the queries raised during this session, yet in case you have any further questions, you may please send them to us in writing at sales at taxman.com. Thank you all once again. We shall soon be back with another vital topic. Till then, stay safe and have a great time. Bye-bye. Thank you.